All right. That is our friends at Helix. That is uh, Women, Whiskey, and Sin. That is off their second album. That is uh, a remastered version of that song. Uh, a long story how that uh, that wave file got in my hands. And then uh, I got listening to it and I thought, I, I want to do a little more stereo separation on that album. And you could hear it in the guitars. I mean, it just sounded so great. And one of the things that made this band sound so great were the guitars. Uh, the way that the guitar players put their parts together on the songs. Brian's going to talk about that tonight. Um, and just to set things up here, White Lace and Black Leather was the second studio album on the h &S label by Helix, their homegrown label. Uh, so they were, in effect, an indie band. They started out as an indie band before they got signed to a major label. And Brian's going to talk more about that tonight. We're going we're gonna to start off around 1981 tonight. And there he is. Hey, Brian. How's it going? Nice to be here, Ken. Is it sunny down in Florida? Um, uh, North Fort Myers, Florida. It's not sunny right now. It was sunny today. Nice day. I was down. I saw Stat Howland today. Uh, Step place for uh, Metal Church. Where he did. Right. And so that that was a, a fun little trip. Yeah, he's got a bar down on uh, Winkler. It's called Stat and Winkler. And uh, Stat Howland uh, actually played for uh, Blackfoot. He played for Wasp. He played for Leo Ford. A uh, variety of bands for your church, and um, but I think Metal Church might be taking time off. The uh, lead guy's got back problems, I think. Okay, so we got Brian Vollmer tonight on here, singer, songwriter, founder, and front man of Helix. He's the guy that's kept it going all these years, and this year Helix is celebrating its big 50th birthday. Hallelujah. <laughs> And we're 50 years old, you know, half a century. Think about that. How many other Canadian bands are 50 years old? We started in 1974. And uh, from 1974 to 1983, we were on our own. And uh, we released two indie albums, like I said. Uh, the first one, Breaking Loose, came out in 1979. And uh, then White Lace and Black Leather came out in uh, 1981. Yeah, so, I mean, there was a, I mean, lineup changes weren't a new thing to you guys. I mean, you guys experienced lineup church changes early on in the band, and you experienced a lineup change before you recorded the second album. That's correct. In the early days, a lot of guys left because they just weren't prepared for the life on the road. It was, it's a very difficult life. A lot of guys met their future wives, like Bruce Arnold met uh, Bonnie, his wife, and uh, he left the band. And uh, Bert Zubrick met his wife, Sharon, while we were out in an Eastern tour. So he left the band. So we had those people leave. And then from the first album, Breaking Loose, to the second album, White Lace and Black Leather, both indie albums. Brian uh, Derner was replaced by Leo Nevedek, uh, a Polish guy, a big Polish guy from Toronto. And uh, Bert Zubrick was replaced by Mike Uzelak, who came from the uh, Niagara Peninsula. I, I got a question for you. It goes back to that that whole thing of of sort of uh, what happened earlier on in, the, in the sort of lineup changes and why those sometimes occurred. You said, you know, it's not an easy life being a band on the road, is it? No, there was no money, and I'm sure there was peer pressure from family members and friends and it's pretty hard to take as people you went to school with who had factory jobs suddenly had cars and houses and wives and kids and you're stuck in uh, your job playing the circuit for a uh, hundred bucks a week. Yeah, it, 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 not, not an easy life. And, and, and so it's a tough decision to be able to make that. And, and you have to make a lot of sacrifices to your own personal life when you, when you do take on that responsibility. Of course you do. Everything in life is a trade-off, and everything in life is a matter of choices. So, so I'm going to ask you a question. A, it's a fast-forward question that relates to that whole idea of being on the road. The song "Vagabond Bones" mm -hmm. is that is that is that like a hearkening back to that that thought back in the day? 
of how hard it was to to be a working band on the road? That's a song about myself. Although a lot of the lyrics were written by Sean Kelly, it's a song about me. And uh, the struggles I went through, but at the same time, I think the true artists don't really have a choice. You're drawn to the life. And once yeah, you it, choose the path, you're going to go down. There's an old song by Robert Frost. Actually, it's a poem by Robert Frost. It was put to music called Two Roads Diverged. Have you ever heard it? <clears throat> uh, I've heard of it, but I've not read it. Well, it goes like this. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. And sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood and looked down both as far as I could to where it went in the underbrush. Which meant that everyone in their life and you have a choice of going this way or that way. And with musicians, once you make that choice to go down that road, it's a long road. It's a hard road. I tell so, people so, I had a new car when I joined the band, and I didn't have another new car for 26 years, and that's an indication of how lucrative the music business is, kids. <laughs> yeah, it, you uh, you guys uh, definitely lived uh, lived a, a different life, uh, a life sometimes not very frequently traveled um sometimes in some cases the road less traveled but the question is did the life choose you or did you choose the life i think the life chose us i, I tried to uh get away from doing music several times in my life and every time i did there was something that drew me back uh the biggest one was when i went to uh, europe in 1990 and i was going to quit the band and psyche kind of made me feel guilty. He said that we would set the tour up and that a lot of people would be let down if I didn't go and a lot of money would be lost. So I went over there and if I wouldn't have went, I wouldn't have met Linda who changed my life. And I was fully prepared to leave the band when I came back home and guess what? We had this hit in this little old song called Good to the Last Drop and uh, Sapi said, well, you have a hit song. You might as well go out and tour that and make some money off it before you quit. And so I went out <laughs> on that tour through Western Canada, and I, I'm still here today. Yeah, I mean, you, there's the, there's a lot of really, really great songs. As I went back and, and uh, listened to Women, Whiskey, and Sin and sifted through the, the Wave Master, uh, I, I, what a great song. It's it, it's got a really 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 hypnotic sort of beat to it, and uh, you know it it's not a wonder that it was on the other side of the album of it's too late or the other side of the single it's too late. Mm -hmm. Those two songs came out together on a single in 1981, and was that were they were they the two were those singles released together? Um, I can't remember now what happened. We were pressing our own singles as well as our own albums. Right. So, uh, I know I had different versions of It's Too Late at home. And some of them, like somebody had typed something out and then taped it over the label, believe it or not. My, my, my version here that I have here, I'm going to put you on, I'm going to put myself on camera so people can see me now. And, yeah. uh, I'm going to, I'm going to move you. You want to go on that side? Or are you going to stay where you are? Okay. There I am. All right. You're good. All right. So, uh, I've got, um, uh, one here and it, it looks like there was a little piece of tape put over the, uh, there the, you go. the number and it was changed to 310, but it was probably 356, which was the full length track. Well, we shortened a lot of songs back then so they'd fit the radio format, and the correct time was three minutes and 20 seconds. Right. And it's funny because I still write songs nowadays that for some reason they all come in at like around three minutes and 20 seconds. There's been a few uh, longer ones lately, but uh, I know we just uh, wrote one last week, uh, myself and Gord Pryor, 
and uh, Johnny Hyatt, and uh, it came in around that time. There's uh, there is some internet radio that still um, goes with that format, and part of the reason is is they can only get so many songs on a program, so they want to squeeze as much music into a program as they can. And if it, if the songs are shorter format, they can squeeze more songs on the show. Well, they even used to uh, play songs. For instance, Color My World by Chicago. That right. was that song was very, very short. It was like 56 seconds long or something like right. that. And radio programmers back in the day used to put that song right before the news because they always needed something to fill that little hole in there. Oh, right. <laughs> I used to use that Chicago song. And I heard that one of the reasons it became such a huge hit for Chicago was the fact that it was that length and it fit that. A particular time slot for uh, radio programmers. Yeah, I mean there are certain songs that that when they when they hit radio play uh, for some for whatever reason people that resonated with people and, and it took off. Women whiskey whiskey and sin was a big hit for you guys in Europe, especially. And yeah, it led to uh, us getting ink in Sounds Magazine with Mark Butterford. And in Kerrang! magazine with uh, Paul Suter. Right. You, so you that you guys got big press. David, and sorry, that and that gained the attention of David Muntz from the EMI label. So when we were searching for a deal back in Canada with Capital, which was the twin company of EMI, David Muntz came over and said, Look, you should sign these guys because I saw what's happened with Iron Maiden and Judas Priest in Europe. And uh, these guys are like the biggest metal band in Canada. And we were. We were the first metal band in Canada. We didn't really look at ourselves like that because we were really just a band that played cover songs in the bars when we first started. But we naturally gravitated towards heavier music. It wasn't like one day we just thought, okay, we're going to be a a band. We're going to just play heavy, heavy music. That never happened. We evolved to the point where when we finally got our sound, and I think the song where we got our sound was on Check Out the Love. That was the first song we wrote for No Rest of the Record. And we wrote that down in the Bronx in New York. And uh, once we wrote that, then we wrote Heavy Metal Love, Dirty Dog. And, and suddenly we had a sound. We were, the, the, the song sounded like Helix. It didn't sound like anybody else. And it was heavy. And and so by the time you got by the time you got there, how many albums are you in by this point? We were two albums in, but it it was a natural progression as songwriters and as performers where we ended up at No Rest of the Wicked. We were allowed to grow and to kind of grow and feather, you know, like nobody tried to control us up to that point. I think. Right. James- Things changed when we got with the big label. So No Rest for the Wick was the third album? It was the third album. It was actually and, going to be an independent album. And one by one, all the major labels fell out of the running until it was just Capital and Aquarius. And Aquarius was actually like a label that was distributed by Capital. So they were kind of run by Capital. And right. we... Gave them both an ultimatum and Aquarius dropped out and Capital came through. And uh, then Dean Cameron, the president of Capital Records Canada, he said to Bill Seif, our manager, I want to get you signed American. There's more money, more powerful people back to band. And Dean got assigned to the American label. We were never, never, ever signed to the Canadian label. Yeah, and, and that was uh, unusual in the day for a Canadian band to get signed to an American arm of a label because Capital, there was Capital Canada as well, wasn't there? Yeah, we were not signed to that label. And you're right, no. it was very unique. I don't know of many bands back then that were signed to a worldwide deal with a major label. Even Rush was Anthem Records distributed through Capital, I guess. Yeah, uh, I, I mean... And 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 we're we're not going to get too far ahead of ourselves, but that is when things really started to take off for you guys because you guys were given a decent budget. 
you guys were able to produce some really really good stuff stuff you got thought was even produced better than the original music um and you guys got to tour it all came together when we got signed to capital records but it was a whole process it was an evolution and there was a lot of people involved with the success of the band without william Slape, for instance i don't think that we would have had any success he was a super intelligent guy i think at times he was a hard master and i should say master because not that he uh, owned everything but because or ran everything because obviously we could have all quit at whatever time we wanted to but because uh, i think that he had a game plan for us and he was very forward with telling us let's say musicians don't like to be told to do anything no, and he provided a focus for you guys that that That's you might right might not have been That's able to provide for you on your own. Like herding cats, right? All musicians <laughs> care about is uh, getting high and uh, following their dick around. Usually, that is not the first musician that said that to me. That uh, trying to get musicians to do things together is like herding cats. And it was very ironic that the people that now poo poo all those. Uh, misogynistic stuff that we used to do, head, hedonistic, is that what you call it? <laughs> so, uh, you know, about our attraction to women and things like that. Uh, but we were encouraged by everybody in the industry to be like that. You know, you'd go on MTV, you'd go on Much Music, uh, you know, they're all, you know, pushing this, you know, sexual type of thing. Same Are people they- that now go, poo, poo why do you <laughs> And, and and the industry was pushed you in that direction of of being uh, living on the edge and and sort of portraying that rock and roll lifestyle. It was all glorified. It still is. I don't know how you prevent that. Yeah. People do you, now? Do you think that's by the industry I, itself? I was a car wreck and not lucky. So do you think that's by the industry itself, or is it something that just permeates every part of the industry, including the labels? I think it's something that permeates society. We tend to right. not want to rock the boat, especially when we see people abusing themselves and things like that. Um, and a lot of times you figure, well, they're old enough to take care of themselves, which they are. True that. True uh, that. Uh, from experience, a lot, a lot of people won't listen to what you try to tell them anyway. So you're wasting your breath. So we've got uh, a new release coming out, uh, Women, Whiskey, and Sin. It is uh, one of the tracks off of White Lace and Black Leather, the second album uh, by Helix, their second studio album. And and No Rest from the Wicked, which was the follow-up to uh, to White Lace, that um, album was also um, originally on your label, right, before you signed with Capitol. We were going to release it as a indie album on H and S Records, but it never got to that point. We got signed before that happened. And then it, when it got released, it got released with a Capitol label on it. With a Capitol EMI, that's correct. Yeah. So, uh, do you do you think that the association with the with the major label helped at that point? For sure, it established it established this band to this day. We've carried it on, but that foundation of those early videos that cost like hundred thousand dollars plus and money for touring, all that stuff, right? To help promote the band. The place where I have a problem with a lot of the labels is that they own a lot of this old catalog of bands like Helix, probably the Parkman Brothers, Tom Cochran, who knows, right? And um, they're not, not allowing the band the material so the bands can release it. Meanwhile, the labels have discontinued the product. And for instance, on, on vinyl. Um, For sure. Once a year, they have vinyl days. So what the labels do, because they don't want to warehouse the product, cost too much money for a warehouse. So right. once a year, they press up 500 vinyl albums of say helix and put it out into all these stores across north america maybe europe i don't know and they're gone no warehousing 
and they don't want to get into doing deals with bands because it costs more for the lawyer than they'd ever make off of licensing the product. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it's definitely, it, things have definitely, definitely changed. I mean, when you guys got signed with the label, how, how did people, do you think people perceive the band differently when you got signed with the label? Is there some level of credibility all of a sudden that you have because you get signed? We had a huge grassroots following that was that behind us. And when we got a lot of people were very, very happy for us and we were the talk of the town. What I found though, was that after we went four albums and then the band started to decline, you really found out who your true friends were when, you know, when you're working at a hasty market with, with an apron on, let's say. Right, right, um, right. But we had we had that groundswell behind us, and uh, it was it was a great feeling until it wasn't. Yeah, and 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 I mean we're we're gonna get down the road to when it wasn't. But the but the thing about when it wasn't, there were a lot of circumstances that occurred that were out of side of everyone's control. Well, if you're talking about the death of Paul, yeah, that was definitely out of our control, but. Uh, I think music changed and they're in our lives that are older and going through midlife crises and all that uh, normal human being stuff that you never really think a musician's going through. But of course, we're just like everybody else. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and you know, we know you're not talking about. Say what? Of course. No doubt about that. Um, so 81, we're into the, we're into the second album. We're going to be releasing uh, uh, Women, Whiskey, and Sin. That's going to be coming out soon. Uh, Brian, I think I, we're going we're gonna to firm up a date for that. And you'll be watching for that and all the, uh, the store, internet stores on our website as well. And uh, I know Brian will be pumping it on his uh, Facebook page as well. So... I'm you going to be about that, everybody. The story of the song. There's a story behind the song. I won't tell it here. I'll tell it when I do my little video, and then we'll put the QR code on, and you can just put your phone up there and go straight to point of sale. There you go. You'll be you able to go there. And, you can go oh, and pre-save the. You'll be able to pre-save the song. No, but That'll let's, be let's tell the audience what we found out about selling songs. We found that it's better to sell one song at a time because people uh, put them on their playlist ra uh, rather than releasing a full album, which is different than what we've been doing over the past several years. But ironically, it's what they did at the beginning of rock and roll when they were sending 45 to radio stations. It was one song at a time. And they released 20 songs before we, one became a hit. I e the guess who was laughing. I was I was following a page the other day, and somebody had posted on there uh, the forty five one of the forty fives that was sent to one of the radio stations for one of your songs. Did you see that post? No. Uh, I, I, it's Did I get on, away it, a lot of those forty five? I had extra ones. Was it was it an album size though? It, it's it, it's one of the ones with the spindle hole in it instead of the the larger hole for the centerpiece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so somebody said that's a different different style forty five because that is for radio play only. No, I never understood why they put the little centerpiece in in the first place. What the hell was that all about? <laughs> well, just don't see it all. <laughs> Do you, remember, do you remember when you couldn't find a centerpiece? What you do is you take your 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 thumb and your your index finger and you space it out to try and get it where it would spin straight on the record player. I never did that. Sorry, no. Um, uh, I, the middle piece, but, but what was what, what was the whole point of the middle piece? You know, I don't know. Like it's like a hole in a donut. You know. <laughs> Why is there I, holes in donuts? I don't know. Probably so all the donut fries equally, I would think. 
I would guess it has something to do with that. I mean, although then they then they take the donor. At least I can guess something for that, but I can't guess anything for a forty-five. <laughs> like, why have a different piece in the center? Why not just never, have a free hole? It never made any sense to me. I've seen newer forty-fives pressed, and they're actually just they just have the spindle hole in them. The only thing I could think of is back then maybe they were a little bit inaccurate on the on making the hole. So by making a bigger hole, there's more chance of spreading out the air over the could, I don't know over the forty five. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think any any LP back in the day spun perfectly straight, but in the bigger format, you wouldn't notice it as much. I've been picking up vinyl down here at Fort Myers at the Three Masters. Great place to go. Nice. I got a brand new, um, well. Uh, Monster album by Stephen Wolf, pretty good shape. It opens nice. Up. It's got the acid inside, little mice doing arrow and everything on the cover. <laughs> and I got a uh, John Parr album the other day for one buck with Naughty Naughty on it. Wow, Great. that's good. That's a good deal for a dollar. A dollar. Very good piece of vinyl. I was happy with that. And, wow, it was in, and it was in great shape. It was in great shape. I got a Jesus Christ Superstar with the little booklet inside and all the lyrics. Is that you got the is that the four album set? It's one with Ian Gillen saying. Yeah. Was, how ma- how, how many records are there? Just two, right? Two double sided albums. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that that that's a well produced album. Got a good system. That's a well produced album. You were gonna tell me what to get. A Yamaha natural source system. I like okay. Yamaha, but a lot of, a lot of the guys like Morantz. Okay, well wanna... when I get home, you and me. <laughs> we're gonna go. We're gonna go stereo we're shopping. Stereo farming. I want a good. We're gonna stereo, go stereo shopping. All right, have well we'll, we'll be doing that. Have you seen my man What's cave? What's that? Have you seen my your man, man cave? cave? Yeah, back at back at your place. Yeah, that's I cool. Can't remember. So you just want to get a new stereo yeah, system for the man cave. <laughs> yeah. I got some great <laughs> albums out there. You do. My you got a whole was, lot of uh, different stuff. My favorite is John Sebastian. Love it. Spoonful with uh, Nashville cats. <laughs> that was an interesting tune, eh? John Sebastian wanted a lot of great songs. It's it's an interesting tune. I used to love that song. Dirty and gritty. That's a great song. Darling, be home soon. I remember that song. I remember that song coming on. Those songs coming on the radio when I was a kid, and, and those were lyrics that you kept singing in your head over and over. You ever heard Slade do "Darling, be home soon" on their live album, Slade Alive? Um, not even older. It's been, it's been a long time since I listened to Slade. Man, another great band. I met Naughty Holder. We stayed oh, did at you? a hotel called the Columbia House up Hyde Park over in London, England. And right. uh, I remember he came down. There was a piano bar down there. And uh, he came down one day and had a drink with us. Oh, wow. That's Brent, cool. Brent was, yeah, I think Brent was there when he came down. Yeah. Uh, did you um, Did you guys ever know the guys in Budgie? No, but I know they recorded out of Springfield Sound. Yeah, they recorded out of the same studio you guys you guys re- originally recorded out of. Now, now there's a there's a we, we there was a, there was uh, some mixed feelings in the band about your producer on the second album. Lachlan, yeah. What 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 uh, are you are you do you feel free enough to share some of those uh, those differences that occurred when you guys talked about who you're going to use as a producer? Well, I don't know if it was Lachlan or the uh, in the studio got changed or something was different because from the first album to the second album the sounds changed and um, I don't know it was a, it was a once again a growing period for the band. Uh, you know. It, People like producers always get blamed for the shortcomings of the band sometimes. <laughs> in, in retrospect, we were going through a growing period and uh, it sounds as good as the first album, but 
um, when he remastered the album, I was really impressed. It took out that boxiness. Right. I mean, now, now here's the thing. When, uh, when Leo Newbeck uh, came in and Mike Usla came in, what, how, how long had they been with the band before you guys recorded the album? Um, I can't remember now to tell you the truth. It couldn't have been that long because those albums were fairly close together. Because um, cause there's an interesting thing there. I, I, I sensed a, a complete, not a completely different change in musical direction from the first album, but definitely some different writing and some different uh, arrangement styles on the second album versus the first. We were growing different people in the band. Mike Uzlak became a major writer on the next album. I don't know how much he contributed to that album. I don't think much because he just, he must have just joined. He was a young kid when he came out. He tried out in, it was somewhere up in the Niagara Peninsula. It was, he came out in the middle of a raging snowstorm and he tried out for the band and we, we didn't even realize he was only 17 years old or something like that. And uh, we were to find out he had a lot of drugs. And right before we got signed, he became a born, born again Christian. I don't know what happened. He stayed up one night with this girl. And next morning, he wanted to uh, quit the band, quit drugs, quit smoking cigarettes, quit drinking alcohol. He wanted out. It was like a major trans transformation. And did he and, disappear uh, off the radar? Well, he ended up quitting him, and, and we just got signed to Capital, and Capital started getting really nervous about <laughs> signing us because, you know, one of the major writers on the first, on that No Rest of the Wicked album, all of a sudden he was quitting. And right. uh, we assured Capital that it was me and Paul and uh, Brent that did most of the writing, and life went on until Pete Guy who we got to replace Mike, couldn't get back into the States after our gig at the Masonic Temple in Toronto with Motorhead. And so we had to go to Mike and say, look, you got to come back. And Mike said, well, I want money. And so Sipe paid him whatever. I don't know. He made the deal. And he flew Mike down. And uh, our first gig was at the Metro in Chicago. And Mike flew in, and Mike hadn't seen any of these big concerts yet. He had just been playing with us in the bars when he quit. And from the time he quit to the time he came back, we had gone from bars to playing major concerts. And we were playing the Metro in Chicago, and he showed up, and they brought him to the gig. Well, we had rooms upstairs, and this place was an old theater or something, and it was deserted. I remember there was a, a really small amphitheater only for about 75 and yeah there's newspapers thrown around and all this shit in the hallways and stuff and our dressing rooms were upstairs and the metro itself was just black floors black walls black 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 everything was black right black 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 and we were playing there with motorhead and motorhead were traditionally late i don't know if they did it on purpose or it's because they did so many drugs and drank so much but they showed up and they were holding people outside because they were doing sound check. And I was watching out the window and there was like, I don't know, I'd say 500 people out in the street all drinking. Ah, there was a guy with a real logging chain across his shoulder. And the cops were trying to get people off the street. And I thought, uh oh, we're going to have a little riot here. And then they let people in. Well, Motorhead gave us, I swear to God, that much stage room. There was so little <laughs> stage room. Get this, listen to this. They made Fritz set up his kit over at the side of the stage behind the curtain with us. He was off stage. And so Mike, oh, man. Mike had never seen this before. And he's like, what the hell have I just parachuted into? And <laughs> we, walked, we walked out in stage and there was a gaunt with a fist banging the banging the front of the stage like this and they're going fuck off motorhead 
fuck off more head up. You had to <laughs> literally physically step over these these arms, right? And we got to the center stage. I looked over at Brent and I says, play him, play the song, let's get going. And Brent started. And we played everything faster than it's ever been played before. We invented speed metal <laughs> that day. And, and Mike, Mike was with his bass. He was like back against his bass like this, right? Looked scared as hell. And uh, we played that gig and we got the hell out of there. It was a scary gig. You're play- and you're, you're playing for all these, these rabid, diehard uh, fans well, Motorhead, that are not your Motorhead fans. Was very, uh, Motorhead was really a punk metal band. Right. So some of the dudes were real heavy looking. Like there, there was a guy I swear with a real lobby chain, you know, a lobby chain, right? Over the hill. <laughs> right. Scary place to be. Scary place to be. For sure. So I mean, now, now, so Mike he was like leaves the band. Um, we're we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I want to want to talk about that next little step because there's a bunch of stuff that goes on there. Because you said, you know, you've got to reassure the label that the major writers are still in the band and you've got to come up with something as good, if not better than uh, than No Rest for the Wicked. And you guys come up with Walking the Razor's Edge. That's correct. It's the 40th anniversary of that album. It's the 40th, yeah. 40th anniversary of that album this year. And uh, and this year, this year, I mean, um, like pulling teeth right in that album. I don't know exactly when um, that particular. Um, I'm going to see when it was put on. So Capitol Records released it here. They they said in 1984 on, but it it this platform didn't exist in 1984. So I don't see an actual published date when when they actually published this digitally. But this year, uh, Rock You went over 10 million streams. Mm-hmm. 10 million 527 581 currently thank you Healy fans yeah and and here's another interesting another interesting fact and, and i think it's going to happen <coughs> with okay. um with with um the uh second album with white lace and black leather um what we've seen happen with the the first album that was actually kind of a it was kind of a soft release because we didn't do a lot of fanfare on it when we put it out there. And I think it was you, you and I had just sort of gotten to know each other and we said, well, let's get something out there. And well, I, that was I, when I just, I think we're learning as we go along how to, how to market this stuff. You and I are both old school and <laughs> catching up where, where the young kids are at, tell you the truth. The difference is we have the product from being around for 50 years. We've, we've got a vast uh, array of film and, and music and everything else that we're dealing with, a, a cred that we've developed over the years, which is different than younger bands coming out. But as far as marketing the band, I'm learning all this stuff now. And uh, at first, your mind fights it as you get older, I think. But uh, well, the, I just get uh, in my mind that I'm going to go learn something. And Jay's been a big help for me. Jay Panaseco, my webmaster, helping me understand the, uh, how social media works. And uh, this year, I think we're going to do, a, I'm going to do a lot more work with Jay, uh, especially with the Ingersoll show that we're hoping to get in August. Uh, and that'll be great. Yeah, and we'll see what happens. Uh, Jay's Jay's been working with the city already. Anyway, he's got a a big uh, uh, website there where he helps on local businesses and things. He has a how to market product over the internet with his website ideas. So hopefully, those website ideas are going to help sell Helix tickets. For, because nowadays with the acoustic show, there's a lot of uh, small theaters throughout Ontario, and we're hoping to book our own shows and not wait for people to book us, but just for our own shows. And the nice thing is we've discovered that QR code 
the little thing over here that you got in your <laughs> That's right. The tip jar right the there. Tip jar. And what that Anybody can scan that. What enables us to do is to sell ticket, like attract people to point of sale. So if we go into a place like, say, Chatham, there's a theater down there, and we throw an acoustic show at a small hall, in past years, it was very hard to advertise and even harder to sell tickets. So how do you sell tickets? You had to advise people to maybe go to the theater when it was open and try to find the tickets. And, blah, blah, blah. and people don't want to go through that bullshit. They wanted it fast, easy. So the QR code, we'll put, say, a film up of um, Chatham. We'll go down there and I'll walk in front of the building and just talk about the gig coming up and what it's all about. And then we put the QR code in the video and we just post the shit out of it on our Facebook page and try to spread it around. And that's Jay's job to get the word out and help promote the gig. Yeah, I mean, promotion has definitely taken on a, a whole different um, approach for booking live shows and uh, finding, you know, finding promoters that will set up these these live shows are few and far between. And, uh, so you're, you're left to your own devices to try and figure out how you're going to promote and put on your own shows. I just went and saw a fiddle player named Scott Woods. He's a Canadian fiddle champion. He takes out, he spends a lot of money. I think over a quarter million dollars by the time he gets into buses and pre-booking the halls and things like that. But he believes in himself. And I love people like that. Because you really got to believe in yourself to put your nuts on the line for your music. And he still goes out there. And I went and saw them a couple of weeks ago, and I was really impressed. Like, I'm not even really done it quite honestly. I'm not a huge fiddle affectiano. But uh, you're, one of the, you're one of these guys, though, that likes to learn from other people because um, well, yeah, uh, Cam was just so well put together. And everybody in his show was so talented. He had this kid on the drums. He said he was Mr. Rubber Legs. He brought this kid out, and this kid kid danced like a, you couldn't believe. And then he played fiddle, and then he went back, played drums, and he sang a song. I think he sang the auctioneer's song. <laughs> and then uh, Scott's sister was there. She played accordion, and then she played something else. She played fiddle, and then they all came out and played fiddle. And multi-talented people, and uh, I was – Thoroughly uh, impressed and entertained for the time I was there. Was a great show. Maybe I'll have Scott on play a, a couple songs we did to just the show around. That would be great if he'd do it. Yeah, and, and you've also learned from guys like like Cam Grant, who's who, who you've you've often shared his business model or talked about his business model a bit. Well, I saw his band Full Petty Fever. I think it's called Full Petty Fever, and uh, yep. I was blown away. It was like seeing Pink Floyd in a bar. And it really changed my mindset as to what people are looking for. Like, I think his band was 35 bucks that night. I would have paid 45 bucks to see my show. It was a great show. He had it so well put together. It never stopped. I think the days of musicians just standing up on the stage and just playing, unless you're like the greatest guitar player in the world, that doesn't fly anymore. You have to have something else to attract people in. When we started back in 1974, think about it, there was very few forms of entertainment except maybe bowling and going to the bar. So we were kind of it. The whole- Yeah, and you guys, whole, you guys whole, try, you guys- Small towns revolved around the bar when you think about it. That's what I was talking about in the golden age of Canadian bar circuit. Uh, uh, people in town would come out on a Monday night to check out the band and then word would get around town. Next night, you were shit. Nobody would show up. If, if you were okay, more people would show up. So by Thursday night, you have a fairly decent crowd. And then Friday and Saturday, they'd be packed if you were good. Yeah. And, and, so, and, and the thing, and the thing is, you guys... Got... Sorry, go ahead. You guys like to bring the show. I mean, that was one of the things that you guys, you guys worked on from the very beginning was bringing not only uh, the music, to people, but but putting on a rock and roll show. We actually built stages. We carried plywood and two by fours and things like that to build the stage up. Honest to God, nowadays they wouldn't allow it. The uh, you know the liquor board isn't going to allow you to do shit like that. 
we used to actually build the stage out, make the stage bigger and stuff. And, um, but the, if you're going into a small town, when I talk about the social or the town, everybody went out to the bar. You met your future wife there. You, you hung out with people you uh, worked with, that you went to school with. It's a different situation now. Do you, uh, do you remember playing a small bar in St. Thomas called the Wheat Sheaves? Sure do. I love the Wheat Sheaves. I got super eight from the Wheat Sheaves. <laughs> Played. That was one of the best. That was one of the best rock and roll bars around back in the day. Um, did did your drummer have to sit with his head up in the ceiling? In the ceiling? What do you mean? Yeah, I remember. Remember because of the remember the ceiling tiles getting uh getting oh, messed right. up from one the ceiling tiles. Yeah, people knocked the ceiling tiles out because it was a low ceiling, right? Well, not there. There, I used to hang upside down in trapeze. Remember that? I used to. Put these chains up there and make a trapeze or ropes or something, right? Used to hang upside down when we did uh, crazy small town blues. I still love recording that song, by the way. And uh, that's awesome. No, the, the, the place you're talking about where the ceiling came down was uh, in Guelph at the Chooch. We used to have these wedge shaped monster, uh, monitors. They looked like a wedge of cheese. They went like this and then square and then up down, right at 45. I used to stand on top and say, I jumped on top. I go, let's rock. rock. I go like this. The ceiling town, the whole freaking ceiling just came down about six sections all at once. And uh, <laughs> I can't remember who was a drum guy. So we're going to take a break now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that would have. Would have been a, a that would have been a moment with everything coming crashing down on you. I got a better one. I lost my microphone in the ceiling. Of the cap in, caps casing, kapuskas in Ontario. I was swinging it around like this, and it came to the ceiling tiles that didn't come down. <laughs> I got I got up at somebody else's bread mic. I goes, uh, we're going to take a break now. Uh, we got to get my microphone out of the ceiling tiles. <laughs> <laughs> I was the same oh, place. Man. It was called the Jack Pine Room with the caps casing in. A, so I, I guarantee I guarantee you after that show you taped your microphone cord on it. Well, we used to tape it up, but not always. Yeah, <laughs> no uh, doubt because you didn't want to let loose again. The cap in though, a guy rode a motorcycle right through the club, and I didn't even see it. He came in the back door and he <laughs> went out the front door. Everybody sat out the side. You see that? He drove a bike right through the bar. Like, what are you talking about? So when, when you guys when you when you guys put this album out in eighty one, did you guys you guys toured that album? We never stopped touring. We toured constantly. So when you guys went out and were promoting that uh, the white lace and black leather we got album, one week off uh, a year. About one or two weeks a year, we got out. That was it. And were they were those two weeks together, or were they? Well, or were they a times we did go together, and that was a big mistake. And we went, I think we went out to uh, Grand Bend or someplace. We all ended up getting in arguments and breaking up with our girlfriends. And <laughs> you guys used to, you guys used to have a lot of fun on the road too, though. Too much fun at times. <laughs> I, I've seen some of the photographs. Some of the photographs are a little bit crazy. We were a crazy bunch. It started, it started with the Derners. That's where it really started. They were the wild boys. So the Derner, the Derners were the guys that got things rolling. Well, Brent and Brian, they were pretty scrappers, right? Little criminals to an extent. And um, and then Paul came into the band. He was from uh, St. Thomas. He called St. Thomas Little Chicago. He used to do masculine, go up to the water tower, and he'd lay on his back on top of the water tower and look at Sky Tone with uh, his buddy Thunder. Do you know Thunder? I know Thunder, yeah. He'd go up there with Thunder, he told me, I think. But, oh, man. Um, you know, Hackman wasn't any stranger to uh, crime. So. Yeah, interesting. I it, it, dad, we had to stop him shoplifting. We said, Paul, you can't shoplift anymore. Because he was <laughs> he was so fucking poor. He'd go to a drugstore and he'd like steal his toothpaste and shit. We go, look, man, you can't do that no more. You get busted, we're 
you know, you're fucked. <laughs> so we made him quit doing that. Oh man. <laughs> You guys definitely had had a different lifestyle back in the day, and not, that's something that'll probably never re, be relived again because of the times we live in now. Well, I was a green farm kid. I'd never seen any of this stuff before. I was like, <laughs> went to church every morning at school, Catholic school. I was an altar boy. My parents weren't ultra religious or anything, but we went to school every or went to church every Sunday and confirmation all that stuff so you're a bit naive to the to the rock and roll crazy lifestyle well i really hadn't seen drugs to the extent that i did when i got into the band or you know some sex and all the rest of it we'd fight we used to fight our way that, in and out of the bars perhaps over the years and you guys, I mean, you guys start. You guys started. You guys started in a, in a time when when rock and roll was really, really, you know, coming into being in the early seventies. You know, and there was a lot of great rock, music coming out of everywhere. Sport, you know, it was a it was what? sport unless you had a keyboard player in the band. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, and 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 that was again uh, one of the reasons why you guys got together with Paul Hackman because neither one of you were successful in finding a keyboardist. That's right. When, when Don Simmons passed away a couple of years ago, his sister Donna gave me his scrapbooks, and uh, I found the little ad we had put in the paper about getting a new keyboardist. He had saved that out of the paper. I thought that was really cool. I got it somewhere. And one of my wow, so she gave me the scrap. And where where do you think had Helix stayed with a keyboardist? What do you, what kind of music do you think you would have been making with a keyboardist? The same as what you're making, even to this day, or would have? What do you think it would have gone a different trajectory? Well, that's all hypothetical. And to a hypothetical question, there is no answer. But. If I were to venture an answer to that, I would say that uh, we wouldn't have gotten here as far as we got because a large part of the sound that we eventually ended up uh, getting capital sinus with was because of Paul Hockman who played guitar and not keyboards. Right. Yeah, the, that, your, those here. got... Uh, right? The, is that the answer to your question? Well, you know, I think I think it, you really did answer it well there because if you you know when you listen to the lead guitar solos in in Women Whiskey and Sin, you'll see what part of what impressed um, the uh, the folks at Capitol about Helix was the guitar playing because both Brent and and uh, um, Paul had very different styles when it came to playing guitar, and yet they figured out how to play some really great leads together. They were the opposite type of players. Brent was very skilled, exact player. Everything he played with pinpoint accuracy. In fact, I thought Brent was a better rhythm player than he was a lead player. His rhythms were impe impeccable. And when we tried to replace him, we, we discovered that nobody could play a rhythm well. They were all slopped their way through it. Brent was very exact when he played rhythms very chunky gave us a real bottom on the sound but paul was a blues player and not how can i say it he was less concerned with the accuracy and more concerned with the feel he was a great feel player all you have to do right. is that that guitar solo that he does in your woman now from the first album and he was very uh, richie blackmore Ask in his playing. I know he liked Richie Blackmore a lot from Deep Purple. But uh, Paul was a real driving force behind our sound. And when he died, it was very difficult for me to find people to write with me where I could capture that sound. And I don't think we ever totally did because the one guy is missing. But I tried to write as good songs as I could. And I think we eventually did. Songs like yeah. uh, Eat Jesus and uh, Make Them Dance, Power of Rock and Roll. You know, we yeah, have it, 
it t- it takes some time uh, when something like that takes the wind out of your sails because, you know, when all that happened, fast forward when all that happened, there were a lot of major changes that occurred within the 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 structure of the band itself, where you ended up finding yourself um, at that point in time. We're going to get to that as we as we move forward in the history of uh, your world, uh, your life in music, to Helix and beyond. This has been our friend, Brian Vollmer. Brian, thanks for joining me tonight again. Certainly great having you here. Nice to be talking to you, Ken. And uh, um, you every- can come visit me anytime you want down Florida. You know? <laughs> he keeps asking me to come down and visit him in Florida. I'm going to have to go down, like it down for sure. It's a nice day today, by the way. I-, I may not come back. You might end up with a permanent resident. It might yeah, be weekend at Bernie's or something like that. It's October, but it got nice today. It's supposed to be nice and, <laughs> and up in the eighties in the weekend. So, um, and I well, that sounds good. here and Johnny Hyde to keep the company. What more could you ask for? We're going to see that Power, sounds- Power on Friday night, courtesy of William Malmstrom, a buddy of me down here. I'm taking Cam with me, Cam Dick. Will you enjoy yourself at that show? Everybody, thank you for joining us tonight. This has been the Indie Show. Remember, I am Kenny, and you're not. That's Brian Vollmer, and you're not. And we're going to see you next week.